I've spent the last few days reading the presentations that were made at the Parliamentary Health Committee on the National Health Bill. And it's, it becomes quite an extraordinary read because there are presentations from all sorts of health professionals, all sorts of bodies. And what happens is that if, if anybody says anything negative, then you get immediately accused of not wanting to give health care to the poor. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it it's comes out, you, the, the actually minutes of the meeting, pages and pages of minutes, you see what people actually say. And I always start these speeches by saying that none of us believe that. I'm, nobody in this room believes that. And Mike has just shown with inexorable logic that that is not the position, that there are people sponsoring health care to a very high degree in this country. And I personally wouldn't mind if you substituted a very efficient system for my medical scheme. If you had the delivery and you charged me about the same, I wouldn't mind. And we don't mind public health care. And we don't mind uh, getting proper services. And what Mike doesn't touch on because it's, it's more statistical, but if you take the, just the general expenditure on health, sorry, I've just done something I shouldn't have done. If you take the general expenditure on health, I mean, they made the point some years ago, to, I don't know if you, I'm old enough to remember Ivan Illich. You might remember he was a sort of pop philosopher in the 60s and 70s. And he said, you know, if you, if you took, it was in the days of Chris Barnard and the heart transplants. He said, if you took the money that was spent on heart transplants for a few people to survive and you put it into clean water in, in rural areas, you would save X number of children, you see. So, it's, it's a way of dividing it up. And you've seen what Mike has said. I mean, I, I wish, Mike, that you would go, if you dare, to the health committee and put this logic before them because it just stands out, doesn't it? I mean, the, you move the expenditure, you could even improve the expenditure, and I'll come to how we go about that. And I always bring, I bring my constitution. I always say this is my very favorite book. You know, it's, you'll see it's falling apart because it's, it's a remarkable book and it does us proud, it really does. I'm not giving you that speech about we've got the best Bill of Rights in the world, we have, but that's not the point. It's just a, it's a very workable constitution. And the, the first principle is, and it's a very important principle, is that we what's called a consultative democracy. And don't underestimate that. It says it in the constitution that it's a core, it says it that in section 70, 59 and 72, the National Assembly, and these are words out of the Constitution, must facilitate public involvement in the legislative process. And we do that. I mean, we've got the committee sitting in Parliament now. They've sat for three days listening to anybody who wanted to pop up. But there was the, the land access movement in the Constitutional Court said that the public must be afforded a meaningful chance of participating in the legislative process. Now, what happened there, if you remember, the, the land problem became difficult because in 1998, they cut off, you had to put in your claims by 1998, and if you didn't, then you didn't have a land claim. And then they, they found there were thousands of people who had land claims who wanted to pop up afterwards, and they passed a law saying, well, now we're extending the date. And the people who put in the earlier claims went forward and said, uh, You've, you've interfered with my right. I've been around since 1998 trying to pursue my rights. And now you're putting a whole layer of people on top of me, and often for the same land, because people say, this is my land, this is your land. And what happened, it was pushed through Parliament in a very short space of time. They had a, a sort of pretense of, of public engagement. It was all done in about 30 days. And the Constitutional Court said that is not consultative democracy. You've got to give people a meaningful chance to participate, which means a meaningful time to get. Now, we've, we've had that in this country. And what they did, <laughs> and funny enough, it's, it's quite ironic, isn't it, that in this very week, we know that the consultative process was a corrupt thing. The, the very first step of this law 
was this digital company which went around to publicize, in, among other things, national health. So that was the very starting point. They went around, the, the Department of Health went around, there's no, it's, it's the right thing to do. They went around the country and they called meetings and the population came there. If you remember the things on TV, there were halls full of people and that's exactly what you would expect because if you go to any public hospital on a Monday morning, it's a depressing sight, isn't it? You just see queues of, of sad people sitting in rows and extending out into the parking lot hoping that something will happen. Those people rightly and understandably went to the public process, they went to the public meetings and they were invited to make submissions. They made submissions, some of you may have made submissions, they got about 3,400 hand-delivered submissions and they got about an equal number of emails. So now you've got 7,000 people, I'm sure most of them said yes we really need public health. I doubt whether they were <laughs> Mike Settis' analysis of the situation. But that's understandable and they, at the last count they hadn't started, they'd read about 20% of them I think. But I don't think it matters because the people had the opportunity. But the difficulty is this, and Mike has touched on it, if you have a public process and you say to people, please come and tell me what you think about the system, it doesn't work if it's an umbrella bit of legislation such as the National Health Insurance Bill is. Because Mike said, you don't know how the contract with the doctors is going to work. You don't know what the pricing committee is going to say, what the maximum you can charge to do root canal treatment. So you don't know. So you can't comment if you're a, if you're a dental surgeon. You don't even know what is in that formulary. They've got to do a formulary and say this is the treatment you can get from the national health insurance system. So, and over and above that you either pay for it yourself or the complementary role of the medical schemes will come into play and you can go and get your medical scheme to pay for it. But when they're taking your money, and I'll show you how much is going to be taken out of the pockets of people, when they've taken your money, you've got to find money somewhere else. You can't go in to the parliamentary committee now or to the town hall in Rustenburg and make your submissions because you don't know what's in that bill. I make the point there that if you look at the regulation section right at the end of the bill, there's, there's two, it's about a page and a half of this government gazette of 28 different things that need to be regulated. And they include things like the legal relationships. Now that means a bunch of legal relationships because every medical healthcare provider in this country has to have a priced negotiated contract to say I will do your, <laughs> your heart transplant, they make this sort of exaggerated thing, I will do your root canal treatment say for this price and there's got to be a contract. Now that, I don't know how many people are going to go out and negotiate, it says negotiate the contract so it's not just a matter of sort of settling it down. You've got to go and talk to somebody. And then you've got to have a legal relationship with every one of us. Last count is that 58 million people, I think, is what we, what we currently say our population is. 58 million people have to register with their biometrics, their photograph, everything. So it's, it's a, a massive problem. The formulary still has to be done and how you get accredited gets done. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem that is not stated because it's going to come in a regulation which is in the mind of whoever the Minister of Health happens to be in that time. And while I'm using the word time, you know, I've shared platforms with uh, Dr. Nicholas Crisp who speaks on behalf of the Minister. And the, the first one was very optimistic and if you remember the, the President came out and said at one stage 2025 it would be in place. That was just a, a nice little political statement. But the last time I was on a platform a few months, some months ago with Dr. Crisp, he said, well, he doesn't know and, and he's much younger than me. He said, I'm not sure it'll be in my lifetime. It's maybe 10 to 15 years. So, you know, that's what you're talking about here. It's not just something that you can just do overnight. But the problem, and I, the last time I heard Alex van der Heer for, he said, well, that's the problem, you see, because you can't roll out national health 
because you can't have it in, in the Eastern Cape and not in Limpopo because you're doing it progressively because you can't have sort of some of the people on a national system taking budget money to spend on a province. So how do you actually get it into, into order? Now, you, I'm sure you all know Section 27. It's one of those beautifully brief things in the Bill of Rights. Everyone has the right to have access to healthcare services. And Mike has produced figures to show that on, on that international scale, we're not doing badly at all about the access to services if they were working adequately and, and not being, I heard some of the radio use the word yesterday, looted. And this wasn't a... This wasn't a white monopoly capitalist either. It was just somebody talking with inside knowledge of what happens in hospitals. Now the state, this is, section 27 goes on to say, the state must, I've underlined on purpose, reasonable legislative me measures within its available resources to achieve progressive realization of this right. Now let's just start with progressive realization, you see, because you can't, you can't, say I'm giving progressive realization to the right if you take away my medical scheme membership and take my money from that and my money from tax and I haven't got a healthcare system in place anymore. You've got to sort of develop it from the bottom up and I'll come back to the, the other point on that is further down. And then of course available resources. Mike has given you figures. I mean the we're already spending 8.5% of individual and government resources on something which isn't working very well, except in the private sector. And I'll deal with the available resources and how they are tackled and how they are taken. Now, Mike had some figures there. I, the, the, the process began in 1994. That was the first date I could find. The first white paper, according to the the Health Committee said 1998, and that was when the Medical Schemes Act came in as well. But this has been going forever, and, and Alex has got a lot of statistics last time I listened to him about how this process has been going since the early 1990s, this imagination for a national health system, which is, which is a good idea, but it hasn't happened in 30 years or more. Now, the next point is that magic term at the end there, health system strengthening interventions. They call it an HSSI. Everything gets acronym these days if there is such a verb. Now, what that means is that you are, as a first step, and this is at the beginning of the section in the National Health Insurance Bill, it says before you start anything, you must do health system strengthening interventions. And that is a long thing for saying, make your existing system better. Make your hospitals work before you put them into the national health system. And if you look at what has happened in every appropriation bill, there's, a, there's an item for health system strengthening interventions. And it's a small amount of money that they've allocated every year up to now. Because, as Mike said, 102 billion is, has to be reserved for medical negligence claims. And of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a bad process because what happens is this. Every time there's a judgment in the Eastern Cape for a child who's born with cerebral palsy because of a birth defect blamed on the hospital, Every time there's a 30 million, and this is the kind of figures that these judgments have because you have to pay for the health care for a cerebral palsy child for life, 30 million, 25, 30 million per claim. Every time that has to be paid out, it has to come from somewhere. And Mike showed the, the figures out of 240, you need 102 eventually. Now, that money, where does that money come from? It comes from not buying the new cancer machine. It comes from not having the new systems in the hospital. It comes from, from bedding and food, because it's the same money, it's the same pot. There isn't, a, there isn't an insurance system out there with reserves to pay claims. So it's a, it's a self-badly fulfilling incident. Every time you have a, 
um, a claim for 30 million, you probably get another claim because there aren't enough people in the obstetrics department or some machine is missing or somebody has emigrated or whatever because it just isn't there. So just, that's why, I mean, your figure, Mike, you say it's going to go up. It has to go up because you take from where you need the money for health care and you put it into one claim for one bit of litigation and it, it's not working. Now, I'll come back to available resources because that's a, it's a big discussion. And I say it's not a health issue, it's a money issue. And that I think you've, you've seen from the previous slides that you saw. Mike, I really enjoyed them by the way. I really thought it was sort of just putting it out there, just absolutely, I like logic. So when, when it all adds up that way, it's not an emotional thing, it's not anything, it's just there it is. And that's why next time the committee sits in Cape Town, maybe you'll go with a mask on and, and pretend. Now, the, the first thing I want to say is that it, it's competent for Parliament to pass this law. There was a, when I first looked at it, I thought, well, is it? Because healthcare is a national issue and healthcare is a provincial issue. If you look at Schedule 4 of the Constitution, it says what the provinces do and what the national government does. And the, the provinces do healthcare, of course. We know that is provincial hospitals, is this term, and I'm not sure it's still used. So it's, it's within the functional area of concurrent national provincial legislative competence. That's a real lawyer speaking, isn't it? All those four syllable words in a row. But it is a functional area for concurrent legislation. In other words, the, the national parliament can override the provincial parliaments in order to pass this act. Because if you look at the next bullet, it says um, it's a matter requires uniformity across the nation. And section 146 says that if it's something that requires a uniform system nationally, it's parliament's job and not the province's job. And it can be regulated by national legislation. The, the parliament will pass it, then it'll go to the National Council of Provinces. Now, what would happen there is that each province would have its say. And the say is quite important because if, as I will show you later, they take provincial money to put into the national health scheme, the provinces should be complaining. And I, I suppose the Western Cape will be complaining because they're on the other side of the fence from the government. But there's no doubt about that. But it, because there's a majority of the governing party, it will go through the National Council of Provinces. And one doesn't mind the fact that national health laws go through, but do we want this law? So the problem is this thing about uniformity across the nation, because what uniformity do you get? Because as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's different provincial areas and in different states, Eastern Cape has got a pile of these uh, judgments and running on negative. Western Cape does much better. Other provinces are, are falling apart or not falling apart, but the, the quality of healthcare services is different. And you can't just unplug what we've got now, as Mike said, and plug in national health and it starts up the next day because it's, 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 a, it's a provincial, regional, local thing that you have to keep doing. And so you can have the legislative competence, but you can't interfere with provinces as easily as this bill suggests. And I'll tell you more about that just now in regard to the money issue. Now, in the parliamentary submissions that were made in the last couple of weeks, they quote the state law advisor saying that this is not a money bill. Now, Look at the second bullet. A money bill is a bill which appropriates money, imposes national taxes, levies, duties or surcharges, or authorizes direct charges against the National Revenue Fund. The state law advisor said this national health bill, if we put it through Parliament, is not a money bill because it deals with administrative things and therefore it doesn't have to 
have a money bill. And if, you know, if I could just find it for you, the, I hope one of these flags is the right one. But when I, when I get later to the point about sources of funding, it says general tax revenue, reallocation of tax from those subsidies, payroll tax, a surcharge, and there's the upfront contribution. Now, those are exactly the words that Section 77 uses. So you cannot say that this is not a money bill. And it's also a money bill because it requires a massive input into the coffers of national health from day one. Because if you've got to register 58 million people on a system, and if you've got to have a signed contract with every healthcare provider in South Africa, nobody has said what that will cost. And it must be a grand fortune that's going to go into administrative fees. Mike, I don't think your figures even deal with that. I mean, there's a huge cost of just getting this thing going. And of course, there's going to be a bit of leakage as well. But uh, just to get this going, to sign up, and who's going to do that? Who's going to sign up 58 million people on a system because they haven't got any choice because you can't get health care elsewhere. Now, it's going to be progressive, obviously, but it's not built into this, and it's not an administrative bill. It is a money bill, which means, you see my last bullet, only the Minister of Finance can introduce a money bill, and we haven't heard from the Minister of Finance. There have been a few broad general statements, but I haven't heard anything from the Finance Department saying, what their view is on all this money that has to be sucked out of the general coffer into the system. And Mike made the very important point. He says, once you've put all your money on the one horse and you can't stop it running, or you can't stop the race and say, no, I'm losing here, so slow down, please, because it's all just rolling out. And the money is now flowing into something which has a ongoing total cost. You've got to give health care on the formulary to the entire population. So you can't stop. And I'll come back to the problems that that introduces. Now, coming up very shortly is the, is the Appropriation Act. You'll know what happens in our fiscal system. The Minister of Finance has the budget speech. And it's a general broad budget speech saying this is what I'm going to do and this is where I'm going to emphasize and I need more money for the police, I need a lot of money for COVID, etc. And then that gets translated into the appropriation bill, which gets down to those kind of figures that Mike gave us. That's when you say, how much do I appropriate for X, Y, and Z? And that is a process that has to go through Parliament. And I'll come back to what this act says about it. But it says, the bottom bullet there, the money will be appropriated unconstitutionally because it includes shifting of funds from the provincial equitable share. That's a quote from the bill. Now, what happens is this, they, you, you get together and the constitution says each province has to have an equitable share of the national income. When we all get pay our income tax and all the other taxes, VAT, etc., and it's all in the in the national treasury, the provinces have to get an equitable share. And Mike, what is your figure? It was two or three hundred billion, I suppose, somewhere like that. Now, you can't shift that money because you see, you can't say, well, uh, I've now established the national health insurance system and I need a lot of money for it, so I'm going to shift the money out because that money is being used to pay for the provincial hospitals, for instance. So you can't suck it out of the hospitals and then put it into a system of insurance when the hospital is no longer operating properly because you've taken the money away from the province that they used to spend on bedding, food and medicines and machines. So it's, it's not something that you can do constitutionally to shift the equitable share because it's, it's a national thing, national health insurance bill, and you can't take provincial equitable share and the constitution is absolutely clear, give them what equity requires them to run that province. And in our context, run, for instance, provincial hospitals and provincial health systems. Now, the Appropriation Act can only be done by Parliament. 
And that equitable division is done in our... Imagine the, the situation when you have the equitable division, we've just seen it in stark reality, and that was whatever plans the Minister of Finance may have had last year, a whole lot of money had to go into the, the COVID pandemic. So things happen where you have to shift your focus every now and again, which I will return to. And the provincial allocation, I said last allocation was about 500 billion if you total it all up, all the different components of that. And you can't just suck that out of the provincial system and hope things will work. The different purposes for, for that is the provinces put in their budget every year and they say, I need so much for this and so much for that, and then I will use that money and you have to allocate it towards me. And we have a whole debate in Parliament. It's not really a debate, you know. Um, modern Parliament, and I'm not talking about South Africa only, life is so complicated these days that what happens in Parliament is on the floor of Parliament, they don't look at the finer detail of appropriation, how much do we need. They look at a broad principle and say, look, crime has gone up, we need more for police. But you see this, as I say in the bottom there, when it said it's got to be a progressive realisation under Section 27, it's not a progressive realisation because you can't just shift the same money around and say, well, I'm now progressing forward because I want to give health care to the total population if you're taking away what the provinces are doing with your money. Now, this is the, the, the whole key to it. The money must be appropriated from money collected in accordance with social solidarity. Mike used that phrase, and social solidarity means that the, that the wealthier people have to sponsor those who are not well off. And that's an international system, that's the way tax works, and that's why higher earners pay more tax than lower earners. But it becomes an excuse in this, in this bill, and that is where you get into this debate every time you go and talk about the National Health Bill saying, well, you don't believe in health care for the poor because you don't believe in social solidarity, which Mike's figures dispute. Now, this is the source of funding. Firstly, they want to reallocate the current medical scheme tax credits for medical scheme members currently. Now that's perfectly in order, that's a, that's a tax rebate that we get on our medical scheme. The Minister of Finance is perfectly entitled any day, any expropriation, any budget to say I'm going to take away that credit. It's been fiddled with over the years. So that's a completely legitimate way, but that, Mike, what is that, about 30 billion, I think it's in that kind of region, so it's not going to solve the problems. The next one is the bill imposes a payroll tax, and you'll know that the skills, national skills levy is a payroll tax. And we have other payroll taxes like UIF. It's a little bit that they take off in order to fund a specific thing. Now that's, that's fine in the context of skills levies and UIF, but when you get into this kind of money that you need here, it's unheard of to take a, a payroll tax out of people's pocket in addition to everything else to fund a specific system of of government um, solutions. The next one is a surcharge. It's also been called a levy on personal income tax. Now, the bill says that this is where the money comes from, all these things. But it's, you see, it's, it's unique in my experience for you. It's not unique, but it's unusual except in sort of wartime and other times to say, I'm going to put a surcharge on your income tax. You have to pay another 10% because I want you to pay for the National Health Insurance Bill. It cuts across the whole constitutional framework because the minister is supposed to decide year on year what money is needed for different things. So you can't just say, I'm going to put a surcharge. And the Public Finance Management Act and the Constitution does not allow you to say, I'm putting this block of money aside legislatively for health only. And I don't care what happens in the future. If there's a need for more policing, if there's a need for more education, tough luck, because this is a surcharge for health only. I, I want to take that money specifically. And it's not what the Public Health um, 
Public Finance Management Act says. And the two things that override the National Health Bill are the Constitution and the Public Finance Management Act. It says so in Section 3, I think. So, and where's the Minister of Finance in all this? And I say there, what about police education? What happens if you have a drought or major, some other major disaster, some terrible cyclone in KwaZulu-Natal? I don't <laughs> wish it on KwaZulu-Natal people who are listening to this broadcast, but I'm just giving an example. But I mean, you just saw in Australia now those massive fires. They've had a special levy there to, on insurance companies, incidentally, they're proposing to increase the, the tax on insurance policies to pay for some of the public services that are provided. But you see, in, in five years' time, when we've got this whole system up and running and it needs a huge blob of money, and the Minister of Finance says, no, but you know, education has fallen behind. We've got all these unemployed people and I need another 40% for education. You can't say, well, sorry, it's all been taken. Education just falls apart because then you've just got one national health bill which overrides all sorts of other requirements. And then they say that they will get the fines. Now, that's an extraordinary thing because then you have a terrible situation. If the people who are fining you get the money for the fines, imagine if every time you went to the magistrate's court and there was a discretion about your speeding fine and the money went to the magistrate, your fines are going to go up. There's no doubt about it. At the moment, that's not the system. If you get a, a major penalty, I mean, you can 10% of your, your budget as a private company if you contravene the Competition Act. That doesn't go to the Competition Commission. It goes to the National Revenue Fund. And then that's part of the Minister of Finance's funds to allocate to education, drought, health, etc. So it's not, a, it's not something that you can... It, you can allow the f person to be the judge, jury, and beneficiary of a fine. So that's an, also an extraordinary new step. And this is all on top of what, right at the beginning of the act, they call a mandatory prepayment in accordance with income levels. And that means that when you go for national health, you've got to have a prepayment, which will be according to your income. So therefore, on top of your extra tax that you pay, according to your income, the extra surcharge that will go on top of that and all the other things, your prepayment for health services is going to be adjusted. There's nothing wrong with that in principle, you see, because that is social solidarity. But we don't know what it is, because it's just one line in the definition section of the National Health Bill. So when you talk about a consultative democracy, I can't put in a submission saying, well, I don't like it because 10% is too much or whatever the case may be. It's just a line in the, in the legislation. The other thing that happens is that treatment can be denied. And this is some of the things in section seven. It says, there's no medical necessity according to the practitioner. And you go there and you say, um, and, and you, probably a good example, I want my, not mine, I want my breasts reduced because it's giving me back pain. And the doctor says, no, you just want it for cosmetic reasons. I don't think it's medically necessary. Your back's not that sore. And then you go out, and then what do you do? All the people are contracted in. You've got to go and find a private doctor at your expense to go and get the operation done. Then um, there's, if there's no cost-effective intervention according to a health technology assessment, and you can do a search on this bill, you won't find out what a health technology assessment is. But... Um, you know, you have these debates with the medical schemes at the moment. They have these enormously expensive uh, cancer drugs, for instance, 200,000 rand a dose, and there's always a battle about whether it's, it's cost-effective. And some health technology assessment will be done to say, no, that particular treatment for cancer is too expensive and I don't think it's working very well. I suppose it's like the kind of ivermectin debate, does it work or doesn't it, although that's at least a cheap drug. But somebody's going to say, no, this is not cost effective, you can't have that drug. Tough luck, you go and pay the 200,000 rand yourself. And if it's not included in the formulary, which we've, we haven't seen a clue about what it will be in and what will be out, I presume most things will be in, like uh, medical schemes, um, but we don't know. And then you pay on your own. 
You're not entitled to the services, and you, if you don't comply with referral pathways, now I presume what referral pathways means if I've got a pain in my chest and I don't go to my GP because I, I know the heart surgeon very well, and I don't go through the referral pathway, they won't pay for my consultation with the specialist because I didn't go through the, the process. So there are lots of, ways, lots of ways in which we may not get medical care out of all the expenditure which are not on paper already. Now, the f final thing I want to say, I'm not sure it's the final, yes, it's the final thing. The healthcare service providers are not obliged to register, but it's going to be, you know, it's one of those, um, vol it's not exactly voluntary consent, is it? Because if you're not going to get any patients if you're not registered. But I presume that somebody who is a top specialist in heart surgery who's got a big enough private practice and enough wealthy people to come and support the lifestyle and the huge money they pay for insurance, <coughs> then you could say, look, I'm not registering in the system. I've got a, I'm a Holly Street specialist in the, in the English example, and I've got enough of a, of a client base patient base to not be in your system. That is perfectly possible. And you know, section 22 says everybody has the right to choose their trade, occupation or profession, which can be legislated, but I mean, somebody doesn't want to go into the system and thinks they're going to survive anyway, they can do that. So it's not necessary that every doctor will be on. So my closing remarks, just let me just sum it up. It's, it's not a proper consultative system. It's not constitutional in re relation to the way in which the proposal is to take money for this very expensive concept. And then, you know, I was really struck, Mike, by your statement, which was this, and, and Chris, also your opening, you had some sort of alternatives. I mean, what you need here, to me, is, yes, have that, but don't have it exclusively. I mean, if you say, well, I'm going to set up a national health system because I'm going to do some sort of insurance, but it doesn't have to be compulsory. You don't have to do away with medical schemes. You saw the, the health professional people in Parliament this week saying, take away the reserves, take away my private savings account with, with my medical scheme, take away all that money and put it in the system. Well, that's just a, a one-off and it's not going to work. So you can have this, and I think the health inquiry did that, didn't it, Mike? They said, well, you don't have to have one or the other, you can have both because it's working. I mean, Mike showed us it's working. So give us national health if you think it's going to work. I, Mike's figures and, and, and uh, commentary from around the world show that we're not behind, we're just behind in the quality of care that we provide. So that's, that's the summary. I mean, it, it's, it's mostly constitutional in concept, but in practice, it really doesn't work. And they've got to start again. I mean, I, Alex, last time I heard you, uh, you said some rude things about scrapping it and starting again, which I, maybe you'll say again after me. So I'll leave that to you. But I, you know, it's, it doesn't work from a constitutional point of view. It doesn't work from a fiscal point of view, in my opinion. And it's not doing anything proud. And it's become a, it's, it's exactly like the amendment to section 25 of the constitution on expropriation without compensation. It's really more of a political issue than a health issue or a land issue. And you can't back down. That's why you go to public meetings and say, I'm going to give you national health by 2025. It's not achievable, and it's not achievable legally, and it's not achievable practically. Thank you.